and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve McNay. Coming up, are the polls starting to turn against Tony Abbott? Labor power brokers deliver more bad PR for faceless men. And the white paper for the Asian century. What does it mean for our engagement in the region? Our panel tonight, New South Wales Greens MP Kate Fairman, Simon Cowan from the Centre for Independent Studies, and in Canberra, Bernard Keane from Crikey. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum. Well, the Gillard government has been selling its plan to forge closer ties with our northern neighbours after the release of the Asian Century White Paper. The Prime Minister says the 25 national objectives will help Australia take advantage of the region's growing economic power. Put simply, it's about keeping our economy strong and making sure that we are ready to seize the opportunities in Asia. It's about our population being skilled and being Asia capable. And it's about businesses having the capability to also reach out to Asia and get into the supply chains, get into the markets, get into the opportunities for growth. As part of the government's plan, all students will be encouraged to study one of four priority languages, Mandarin, Hindi, Indonesian or Japanese. And that will be tied to a broader overhaul of school funding. We can't any longer continue to have uh, such a small proportion of kids in our schools learning Asian languages. Remember that Asian literacy and cultural engagement is already a part of the national curriculum and as we continue to implement the national curriculum this Asian languages component will become very much a part of that too. The opposition has welcomed the idea but questions how the government will pay for them. My concern is that we've seen the government announce white papers before like the 2009 defence white paper and then its response to it was actually to cut budget funding for defence. So my concern about the white paper is while it sets out some wonderful aspirational goals, there's no commitment to extra funding, there's no strategic plan, no detail on how we would actually reach those goals. In fact, the government's own budget review last week undermines many of the 25 recommendations recommendations in the report already. Bernard, what's your reaction to the white paper? Well, for anyone who was around in the 80s and 90s, I mean, there's a lot that's pretty familiar. We saw or we heard a lot of this from the Hawke and particularly the Keating governments, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago. I mean, John Garner, uh, Ross Garner was the first to really, uh, to, to really sort of tease out these issues. Um, and the Keating government in particular, I mean, the, the whole big picture vision from Paul Keating was, you know, very Asia centric. And he was the first one to really connect up the goal of engagement with Asia on, an, on a sort of economic level with, uh, with a whole you know, st you know, series of strands of, of domestic policy. And that's pretty similar to what, we've, what we got yesterday from the government. We got you know, this high level sort of concept of engagement with Asia, the need to take advantage of uh, opportunities in Asia. Um, the difference, of course, being that now we're, we're sort of a, a whole generation of economic reform and, a, and mind boom than we were and Paul Keating talked about this sort of stuff. But it's the same sort of thing. I mean, really, Labor's put pretty much all of its current domestic agenda um, and some of its foreign policy agenda, it's just moved the whole lot under the uh, the rubric of, of the Asian century. I mean, everything's in there. The, the national disability uh, strategy, uh, Gonski, uh, as we heard just now, uh, all sorts of stuff, food security, the NBN, they're all in there. Um, it's just that now they're all sort of falling under the, 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 the architecture of making sure that we're able to take advantage of the of the growing uh, Asian middle class. So it's a it's a, in a way the government's kind of handed itself a, a, an overarching strategy, even a dare I use it, you know, the, the overused term narrative um, about where it's going to go with its current set of plans. So in a way, there's not actually a whole lot that's uh, that's new here in spite of the, you know, the 25 aspirational goals and the um, I actually counted them. I think there is 129 separate pathways sort of laid out underneath each of those sort of 25 dot points. So um, it's, uh, there's a lot of detail there, but in terms of what's actually new, you know, it's a little bit limited. Simon, you're interested in uh, security and defence issues. What's your take on it? Yeah, I'd certainly, I'd agree with a lot of what Bernard said. I think uh, the government's taken a lot of their existing policies and they've, they've shoehorned them under the heading of, you know, the Asian century, um, things that probably don't have a lot to do with the engagement in Asia. Uh, and I think there's a lot of alarmism over the Asian century and the idea that Australia really desperately needs to catch up 
Um, I'm not sure that's that's right. I think what's going to drive Australia's engagement in the Asian century is what's been driving Australia's current in engagement with Asia. Economic ties, immigration, geography. From a defence perspective in particular, I think um, there's been a lot of work done in, in our immediate region in terms of security and I think going forward that's going to be very important to, from an economic perspective as well to make sure that Australia's defence force contributes its share of security in the region. Uh, we continue to engage with the US, whose presence is probably muted in the report from, from what I've seen. I think the report could do a bit more to talk about how the US will engage with Asia, um, because it will be very important for China in particular. But, you know, from my perspective, a lot of it's stuff that's been said before doesn't necessarily fit in, um, and a lot of it will happen without the government having to do anything at all. Kate, uh, what about the, the plan to increase the teaching of Asian languages, is that something you support? Well, we, we do support it, but again, as, as Bernard and Simon have, have said, we have seen this be, before. We saw it with the Hawke government, of course, in the 80s. Um, what we do know is that Indonesian, for example, the teaching of Indonesian languages in uh, New South Wales, we had more Year 12 students studying it in 1972 than we did in 2009. We've seen a huge decline in the teaching of Indonesian uh, uh, over the last 10 years, for example, declined by 50%. University of Technology, University of Western Sydney, they've both stopped teaching uh, Indonesian lang languages. University of New South Wales will stop next year. So we're actually seeing this huge decline. You could almost say a crisis in one of the priority languages that the government is so keen to promote. So they also have to have a look at that. If they're saying school curriculum, they need to have a look at what's happening in the universities right now. Well, for his view on the white paper, we're now joined by Rory Medcalf, the director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. Rory, welcome to the drum. Thank you. Uh, we're now 12 years into the Asian century. What took so long for this white paper to be delivered? Well, I think that's a really good uh, way to open the conversation because, frankly, this is a document that has wonderful aspirations, as we've heard. Uh, I think some good ideas, but. Uh, we should have seen this document some years ago uh, when, for example, we had a budget surplus big enough to actually undergo the national transformation the Prime Minister is, uh, is talking about. Better late than never, I suppose. Now, you've identified a few weaknesses in the paper, but let's start with the positives. What do you think is good about it? Sure. Well, I, I uh, completely agree with the, the need for Australia to engage with Asia across the board. I mean, by some definitions, I would say a, uh, a Australia is essentially uh, an Asian country. If you define Asia as the, the Indo-Pacific region, well, we are the, the quintessential Indo-Pacific nation. Uh, so there are positives about recognising that, about recognising that we shouldn't just be uh, selling commodities to Asia, we should have a diverse economic engagement, we should be skilling our people, Asian languages, capabilities to deal with Asia culturally and so on across the board. So there's a lot that's good in there. Uh, the huge question is, uh, will the government deliver? And, and we just don't know that yet. Okay. What about weaknesses in the paper? The paper's supposed to address the opportunities and the challenges of the Asian century. The PM made that clear. But if you start dissecting the paper, there's a hell of a lot more there about opportunities than challenges. I think it's, um, it, it's an extremely optimistic set of views. And for example, uh, the rise of the middle class in India and China is welcomed as the great economic driver of Asia and, and our opportunities. And fair enough, it is. But when you've got hundreds of millions of new people coming into the middle classes in those two countries over the next few decades, there's going to be all sorts of instability that could arise, uh, nationalism, expectations among those middle classes, their own resource demands, which will place huge environmental pressures. And I thought that the, the risks in that uh, weren't really explored, including the risks, frankly, of Asian countries like China and India getting involved in, in conflict. So potentially you've got competition of resources there. You've already got a number of uh, problems problems festering away, India and Pakistan, South Korea, North Korea, potentially China and Japan. Should there be more emphasis on defence? And at the moment, you, we're seeing two cuts to de the defence force. Well, the government will say there's a defence white paper coming, another one after the 2009 one that sort of seems to have, uh, have disappeared down the memory hole a little bit. But, um, you know, this paper should at least have set the scene for the next defence white paper to say what the government expects of our defence force and our diplomatic capabilities, intelligence and so on in the 18th century, maybe as tools for very positive engagement but also uh, for more <coughs> defensive purposes and it didn't really do that. So that was uh, one note where I was disappointed. What about the issue of languages and study more broadly? There's this uh, 
uh, and for 12,000 scholarships for young people to mm. be able to study in the region. Also the plan to boost uh, Asian languages in Australian schools. Will that make a difference? Look, it, it can and it should make a difference. Of course, though, if you're training students in Asian languages now, we're not going to reap the dividends for a long time. And uh, it's, a, it's a pity that the, the paper didn't, for example, look at uh, you know migration for uh, basically big quotas to bring language teachers into Australia, because that's one of the categories we're going to desperately need, need to fill. But yes, it will make a difference if it's followed through with funding, but languages alone won't do it. There'll be other skills needed and it shouldn't just be uh, public servants and, uh, and business people who are trained or experienced in dealing with Asia. We need that to be right across the community. Because that was one of the criteria that was raised in it too, was having bureaucrats and uh, yeah. businessmen trained in, in Asia skills. You'd like right. to see that expanded, wouldn't you? Well, it's interesting that the report, I think, rightly said we should have a certain quota of our senior public servants experienced in Asia, a certain number of board members of big corporations with Asia experience. Yeah. Um, I think that should be extended it a bit further. It would be intriguing, for example, if all federal parliamentarians were required to visit Asia on their, um, their international taxpayer-funded visits and to really have to pitch a very strong case if they're going anywhere else. What about the push to expand diplomacy in the region? Is that a good move? Is it achievable? Uh, well, it's an absolutely good move and uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I and colleagues have asked for a long time at, at the Law Institute and elsewhere that, uh, frankly, Australia is surprisingly weak in its uh, diplomatic resources, one of the uh, weakest countries in the OECD for our number of diplomatic missions, uh, including our footprint in Asia. So, of course, that needs to be resourced more. And the promises on that are there, but they're, they're, they're quite thin. I don't think we're going to achieve this without a much bigger diplomatic footprint in okay. the region. OK, Rory, thanks very much for coming on into the drum th this afternoon. Oh, OK, well, the federal government would certainly be taking heart from the latest opinion poll. The news poll in today's Australian puts the ALP primary vote up three points to 36%, while the coalition is down four points to 41 that means, after preferences, the parties are even at 50 points each. Labor MPs, who often don't comment on the polls, jumped on the results, claiming they show the opposition leader is running out of steam. I think Tony Abbott's run out of puff. Uh, I think he's run out of petrol. I mean, he, he was off uh, uh, very early, running hard against the, the carbon price and predicting that it would be the end of the world and the sky would fall in. Well, the sky hasn't fallen in, and I don't think he's got any other strategy. Essentially, it's all about opposing whatever the government does. Trade Minister Craig Emerson praised Julia Gillard's fortitude and her refusal to be swayed by opinion polls. Well, the Prime Minister's had the kitchen sink, the bathroom vanity and the carport thrown at her, and she's still standing, delivering on the policies to make Australia strong, to have a strong economy and to ensure that everyone gets a fair share of the benefits of that strength. What the Prime Minister has demonstrated time and time again is that we don't govern for opinion polls, we govern for Australia. But Tony Abbott and his front bench colleagues dismissed suggestions from reporters it might be time to change the conversation. Every day, my job is the same. Uh, my job is to hold a bad government to account and to be a credible alternative. And the public, I think, will understand that the next election is going to be a referendum on the carbon tax and the next election is going to be a referendum on Prime Ministers who say one thing before an election and do the opposite afterwards. What I think is happening out there is, is Australians are longing, are longing for an end to this uh, parliament. I mean, this parliament is one that I think has been characterised by more failure than, than any other under this shabby government. Bernard, what kind of pressure is Tony Abbott facing now with the narrowing of these polls? Well, I, I think this is as much about Julia Gellar as, as it is about Tony Abbott. I'll get to Tony Abbott in a sec, but I mean, uh, Labor's collapse in the polls and Julia Gillard's personal collapse in the polls started back in February last year when she announced the commitment to the carbon price. Up until then, uh, post-election, you know, she and Tony Abbott and Labor and the Coalition have been neck and neck. So, in a way, what we're seeing now is a kind of a, a repair of the long period of damage that that carbon tax commitment uh, did to Labor. What Tony Abbott's done wrong, I suspect, is that he's failed to use a long period of ascendancy, you know, even bearing in mind the fact that he was never very popular himself and, and oftentimes pretty much as unpopular as Julie Gillard. Uh, he hasn't used it to actually do anything about crafting an alternative uh, agenda. He's, he's stuck to the negative, which he is amazingly good at. I mean, he is, he is simply probably the most outstanding opposition leader in terms of that sort of campaigning uh, that we've ever seen. But he's failed to use the opportunities he's had 
to really sort of develop a fallback position, which is, you know, some elements of a positive agenda. He's got paid parental leave, um, but that's sort of pretty much it as far as um, as far as domestic policy goes. And when he when he continues to press lines like, well, the next election is going to be a referendum on the on the carbon tax. Well, you know, already the carbon tax is kind of disappearing in the rearview mirror, and um, it does start to look a bit like he hasn't got a he hasn't got a plan B. So that's probably something he's going to have to work on over summer because going into into an election year, you know, he does look as bit as though he's tacked kind of really aren't working out at the end at the moment. And if the numbers continue to, to go south, it's going to become clearer and clearer that um, that his own unpopularity is weighing down a coalition's vote. And that's, of course, the period when people start talking about leadership changes. Simon, do you think there could be some nervousness going on in the coalition party ring? Uh, I'm not sure that there's any nervousness going on there. I think Tony Abbott actually is really looking for this kind of fight. I mean, as, as Bernard was saying, he's, he does the negative quite well. Um, I think there's a real problem in Australian politics is that we're seeing this emergence of, of very personal rhetoric and very personal attacks coming to the fore. This opinion poll is at least partial evidence that those sort of attacks are working. Uh, you see the Prime Minister's recent speech and then this part of an ongoing campaign to paint Tony Abbott in a negative light. Uh, I don't think that's a good thing for Australian politics. Uh, going further than that, I think there's a significant issue in Australian politics with uh, opposition in particular trying to adopt that small target approach that worked so well for, for Kevin Rudd in 2007. You know, don't announce any policies, don't be out there presenting your views in case someone disagrees with you, just sit there and adopt the positive bits that the government comes up with and throw mud until we get to an election. Um, I don't think the Australian, I think the Australian people are very tired of that approach. Kate, what do you think is going on here? Well, I think they're also tired of uh, Tony Abbott saying that he's going to repeal the carbon tax if elected, or the price on carbon if elected. Um, we're seeing more and more success stories as a result of the carbon price. An example just this week was the um, the pig farmers in Young who are using the methane from pig manure in their piggery um, to uh, feed that electricity back into the grid, basically. So their elect electricity bills used to be $15,000 a month. They've not only reduced to zero, but they're now getting, this family's getting $5,000 a month for feeding this back into the grid as a, as a direct result of the carbon price. We've got to remember that as a result of the increase in the tax-free th threshold, we saw uh, a generous compensation package as a result of that. So we've got about, about a million people who no longer need to fill in a tax file return they'll be saying, well, what's going to happen under an Abbott government? We've got pensioners who actually have more money uh, as a result of the compensation payments as well. So with Tony Abbott, you know, every few days saying this next election is going to be a referendum on the carbon tax, I think a lot of these people who were, um, you know, a little bit uh, uh, worried are seeing uh, benefits actually at the moment. So that could be playing out as well. Bernard, interesting uh, that on the day that this poll's come out that uh, Tony Abbott was once again out of business around the Canberra region uh, talking about the carbon tax. It's, a, it's the same routine that he's been running for the last couple of years. Yeah, it was like we were back in May or June. I mean, it was a... Uh, uh, you're, you're right, it, it was it was the same stuff we've been seeing from Tony Abbott month after month. And the first couple of questions, I think, in question time today were about the carbon tax as well. And, and you know, it's it's clear that it's just not gaining any traction. And, and I, I suspect that's partly because Tony Abbott sort of... And, and, and his colleagues, you know, wildly overplayed uh, a lot of this. Uh, but also because the the implementation of the of the of the uh, of the carbon price so far has been pretty glitch free. I mean, if we go back to the GST, um, that uh, that had a bit of a rocky start. It initially seemed to go okay for the Howard government, but uh, then they stuck they struck awful trouble with uh, with pensioners, for example. That was a real problem for them uh, at the end of 2000, going into 2001, an election year. This time around, the government's managed to get through a pretty significant uh, change to the tax system, reasonably okay so far. Partly because they've been so focused as says on um, on overcompensating people so um, you look Tony Abbott's going to have to find you know some extra strings to his bow um, otherwise um, you know the the, the sort of the, the, there's a certain hollowness to his to his um, to his rhetoric at the moment that okay. uh, I think is pretty apparent to everyone Simon quick response from you yeah look I, I think that's probably right I suspect the next election is going to be about the economy it's not going to be about the carbon price uh, it'll be about regulation of the economy It'll be about the inefficiencies in our tax system. It'll be about the inability of the government to produce a surplus despite having basically record economic conditions. My view is that the, the political talking heads find a lot of interest in, in this sort of debate that's going on, but 
out in out in the real world, if you could call it that, um, people are much more interested in the things that impact them from day to day, and their economic outlook is going to be the most significant thing, particularly okay. if you look at what's happening around the world at the moment. Okay, the Prime Minister is facing new claims that she actively worked against Kevin Rudd in the days before the leadership coup in 2010. Former Labor MP and journalist Maxine McHugh has been promoting her new book called Tales from the Political Trenches. And in it, she accuses Julia Gillard of being a disloyal deputy who used internal party polling critical of Mr Rudd to her advantage. I am saying that I think Julia Gillard was impatient for the leadership and she allowed a sense of crisis uh, to be created around Rudd's leadership. And a principal tool in that sense of crisis was this private party polling. I think we're still uh, living with the consequences. I think it's actually led into a kind of political culture that's a bit of a free-for-all at the moment. It was a convention-busting moment. The Prime Minister refused to respond to the claims on Radio National this morning. You can put the question uh, 900 different ways and you're going to get the same response. It's just simply not my focus. Uh, I am focused on the nation's future and the plan for the nation's future in this century of change I delivered yesterday. Kevin Rudd weighed in again today, describing the events of 2010 as traumatic for Labor and the nation, saying it was time for those involved to explain what happened. This was a traumatic period for the country, for the Labor Party, uh, and for a whole bunch of people uh, who were deeply associated with those events. But as I've said before, uh, it's important that everybody associated with those events uh, is just honest about happen so that the party and the government can move on to the big policy challenges of the future. And the opposition has seized on the latest claims to once again question Julia Gillard's character. One of Labor's power brokers told me that Julia Gillard was already in 2007-8 putting her people, to use his words, into the positions of influence in order to undermine Kevin Rudd because she was going to seize power at the first available opportunity and when Kevin Rudd was the weak wildebeest in the pack she pounced and tore him to pieces. Bernard you've been making your way through Maxine McHugh's book what does it tell us about the events of 2010 and, and will it cause the PM any more damage? Um, well we've got, we've got a couple of narratives one the, the, the sort of Maxine McHugh narrative is that um, uh, Julia Gillard was this was this over ambitious uh, deputy who was who's desperate to use anything uh, to to get the top job, and she allied herself with um, with factional power brokers who uh, were resentful of the fact that Kevin Rudd wasn't paying them enough attention. That's kind of the core, you know, Rudd supporter narrative. Against that is the basically the the government line, which is that Kevin Rudd was this sort of dysfunctional psychopath who couldn't you know couldn't run anything, and uh, and needed to be moved on. So when Kevin Rudd says we need you know we need some honesty about that, well, we're not going to get anything more than than the two sort of narratives. Um, uh, that we've already been given. What we do get that's new from Maxine McHugh, though, is a bit more detail about this issue of the private polling that was used um, uh, during June 2010 to undermine uh, Kevin Rudd. And in particular, there's two claims in the book that are, I think, pretty significant. One is from Robert McClellan. He's put his name to it. He's gone on the record saying Brendan O'Connor showed him this, uh, this qualitative polling, UMR, polling about Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. Now, Brendan O'Connor denies that. The other is from an unnamed government MP who says Julia Gillard herself actually showed him or her this polling in the days leading up to the coup. Now, we don't know whether that's true or not. We don't know who's made that claim. But if it's true, it's pretty... Uh, it's If it's not quite explosive, then it's, it doesn't sit very well at all with Julia Gillard's claim that he was, she was this sort of reluctant last-minute draftee. Uh, into the into uh, into the challenge to Kevin Rudd. Okay, what did you make of Kevin Rudd's comments today? It's important for all of us to be honest about what happened at the time, and that is the best way for us to all move forward. Does does the honesty stick need to be passed around the Labor caucus? I think what's pretty clear is most of the nation has moved on. I mean, most people have moved on, and I think most Labor supporters, those supporters and voters who were appalled at what happened back then, are probably quite pleased now that Julia Gillard has finally found her stride, and the polls are starting to look good for her. And I think they would be looking at this and just going, what are you doing? And I think it would be a small minority of Labor supporters who are actually pleased with what Kevin Rudd is doing right now. Simon, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think Julia Gillard's paid the price for for being part of that 
that coup and I think that the public have decided in their own mind what role she had. I don't think that there's anything in this book that's likely to change many people's view. Um, you know, I can see why Maxine McHugh would want to write it given, you know, she's obviously got quite a close personal a, a association with those events. But I don't think the electorate at large really will turn too much on this. What I think is more interesting about this event is that it's another event in a, in a long line of events of Kevin Rudd's supporters coming out as soon as the government starts to make some headway and just doing something to destable things a little bit. I mean, the government itself has, has made a few missteps, but there's been quite a lot of these sort of Kevin Rudd pops up again on TV or, or you know, one of his supporters says that she did something wrong and all of a sudden it's back to the leadership debate again. And I'm not sure that that's helpful at all. OK, well, Julia Gillard is refusing to buy into the internal party row over whether Penny Wong should keep the top spot on Labor's Senate ticket in South Australia. Over the weekend, the state conference relegated finance minister, minister to second place in favour of factional leader Don Farrell, who played a part in the leadership coup against Kevin Rudd. Leader of the House, Anthony Albanese, is furious. He's threatening to press the ALP national executive on the matter this Friday. The opposition leader says it's proof the faceless men of the party are still calling the shots and he's challenged the Prime Minister to take them on. Kate, uh, what's your thought of, thoughts about this? What does it say about the Labor Party that they would put Don Farrell on the number one spot ahead of Penny Wong? Yeah, well, what it shows is that the Labor Party is absolutely controlled by uh, right-wing forces and controlled by the Shoppies Union, which is um, Don Farrell's uh, union, which is the same union uh, that I think is behind the Prime Minister's uh, reluctance to support marriage equality or same-sex marriage. It's the same union that uh, played a part in the ousting of Kevin Rudd. So, of course, uh, the Prime Minister is sitting there not wanting to get involved um, in this issue. But well, it is outrageous that, that Penny Wong is not top of that ticket. Well, New South Wales General Secretary of the, the, the Labor Party, Sam Dastyari, says it's just democracy. He says that Don Farrell won a, won a democratic ballot. Well, it's not really democracy. Democracy would be all of the Labor Party rank and file voting voting on who they wanted top of the ticket. That's what the Greens do, that's, that's, you know, that's real grassroots democracy in parties. This is right wing, well, all factional heavyweights. We know that they control at least 50% of the ticket. And we know that the Shoppies Union is one of the most powerful on the, on the floor of the conference. They've got a lot of uh, shop assistants who are apparently signed up to the union. It's a bit of a mystery in terms of how much they all pay. It's a bit of a mystery in terms of how much all of those uh, members are actually involved in the union and are, and are able to have a say. But we do know there's a lot of people who work in retail and they are signed up. So there are tens of thousands who are signed up to this union, apparently. So therefore the union's very powerful and it is able to, to call the shots. And unfortunately, it doesn't just call shots in terms of, you know, labour and industrial relations issues. It calls the shots within the Labor Party in terms of moral issues like, uh, well, supposedly moral issues like marriage equality or same-sex marriage. Uh, Bernard, the PM was asked about this today and, and she said she wouldn't say whether Pennywog should have got that that spot or not? Does that, does that say the Prime Minister's powerless to intervene? Oh, I'm not sure she's powerless to intervene. I think if she, uh, if she really wanted Penny Wong to be uh, top, she'd throw a weight behind it. But, I mean, politics, as John Howard sort of said, you know, politics is about numbers, and if the numbers don't stack up, then... Uh, then you miss out. I mean, it's it's not as if Penny Wong's in any danger. The number one and number two spots on the on the ALP Senate ticket are safe as houses. So there's no there's no real impact in terms of uh, in terms of that. It's more a question of the optics. I mean, Labor's Labor's been running what looks like a fairly successful campaign against Tony Abbott as a as a as a sexist and as a you know as a as a reality sort of social conservative and here they are elevating Don Farrell from Australia's most reactionary socially conservative uh, and maybe even sort of uh, homophobic unions um, uh, to the top of the ticket. I mean it, the, the optics of it is uh, is pretty wretched given you know the very strong focus that Julia Gillard and and the and the government have had on the whole sexism issue over recent weeks. And Simon so, it hardly makes the ALP look like a meritocracy does it having Don Farrell above Penny Wong? It certainly doesn't and I think um, I don't think the issue so much as sexism. Um, I think the issue is that the, the factional leaders on the right are sending a bit of a message to some other people in the party. And it's most unfortunate because it really shows a contempt for the Labor Party as a whole and somewhat of a contempt for the voters that you've got a, a cabinet minister who isn't considered important enough to be leading the Senate ticket in, in her state. I mean, the factional leaders are saying, you know, we still run this party. We still have the numbers on the floor where it counts. And there's been a lot of talk lately, I think, about, about trying to take on the factions and somehow break this down. This is a bit of a message to say, you know what, we actually still have this power. Well, the Greens are copying some flack.
usual planning day for New South Wales MPs last week. The agenda for the meeting asked members to pretend they were explaining their party and its ideas to aliens. The Sunday Telegraph reported no specific policies featured in the matters up for discussion. The Greens lost three of their four seats in last weekend's ACT elections and they're facing predictions of fading support at the next federal poll. Now, Kate, you're about to leave the New South Wales Parliament to have a run for the Senate. What did you think of this idea when you saw it on the agenda? Well, anybody that has undertaken any strategic planning, uh, full day workshops, and I think most you know people who work in big corporations, for example, do it all the time, NGOs, they would be well aware that part of the agenda, particularly at the very beginning, is like an icebreaker exercise, normally very uncomfortable and you don't want to do it. And you yeah. roll your eyes and go, oh. So this was almost one of those. Mm. And what it was... What did it you was, have to catch your fellow Greens as well, well as a trust exercise? Or? No, we did not have to do that, but I have uh, worked in organisations where we haven't <laughs> had to do that and it's kind of quite freaky. So that's what so that's what that was about. It was five minutes. I think we all basically all we had to do was explain... Uh, the whole world as we knew it in five minutes. It was a, it was to get us out of our uh, you know box. Which and did you is, uh, raise your occupy. concern that this would help uh, your enemies portray you as being wacky? Well, no, I did, and that might have gone through my uh, uh, head at the time when I uh, saw it. But you know, these things, we should be able to do stuff like this. I mean, it, it was a quick five-minute thing. The rest of the day was uh, very productive, and and those those weird little five-minute exercises you get at the beginning of strategic planning retreats. You know, that's what they're like. And unfortunately. Uh, News Limited, who have said they want to destroy the Greens at the ballot box, got it, got their hands but on it. But presumably someone leaked it from the Greens to News no, Limited. No, no. What happened was one of us left some papers in a place where we shouldn't have. So right. that wasn't a leak. And I'm I, hand on my heart, right. that's what happened. OK, so the yep. Greens need to Which get their papers in doing, order. Exactly. <laughs> okay. What was paper was it? <laughs> <laughs> and different coloured pens and lots of sticky notes, Bernard. That OK. That's about right. <laughs> Coming up next on The Drum, the story behind rise of underworld figure Carl Williams and what led to his brutal murder in jail. We're going to talk to investigative journalist and author Adam Shand about his new book on the crime boss. The American Republican Party loves to talk about Ronald Reagan. Reagan, 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 Reagan. Everything's Reagan, 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 Reagan. I'm the next Reagan. But would Reagan even recognise the party he once led? The Republican Party is more conservative. Oh, he'd be too liberal now. Is the party of Reagan tearing itself apart? I don't need to take that and I don't. Without compromise from both sides, this place doesn't work. The Party of Reagan, Sunday on ABC News 24. If you could tell any story in the world, what would it be? At ABC2, we've given five young Aussie filmmakers some cash and a brief. I wanted to discuss a taboo topic. To provoke and inspire. Oh, I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> no censorship. This was a strangulation of WikiLeaks. No holding back. One in eight Australians have genital herpes. These are their films, and this is their opening shot. Starts Sunday, 9.30. Our guest tonight is an investigative reporter who's been writing about Melbourne's underworld over the last decade. Adam Shan's latest book focuses on crime boss Carl Williams, the baby-faced killer who became a cult figure courtesy of the hit TV series Underbelly. Williams was at the centre of Melbourne's gangland killings and after being convicted of murder, he met a rather gruesome end in Barwon Prison at the hands of another inmate. Adam Shan, welcome to The Drum. Thank you very much. Now, in the book you write about how you were contacted by Year 12 art who was doing her main work on Carl Williams and she told you that when he died she received 50 text messages from her mates about Carl Williams. Why is it someone like Carl Williams can be a folk hero for that 18 year old and her friends? Well she was I think 10 when he when he was really on his rampage in 03, 04 um, but uh, I think watching Underbelly and seeing all the media coverage and so forth uh, he, a whole image a whole new image was created for Carl and uh, they were re re responding to that image which is much more like a, a sort of movie narrative type Carl not the real Carl so in writing this book I was trying to sort of I guess uh, reclaim the fact from the fiction before it was totally submerged. I'm not sure that they would be sending those same text messages if they read your book. Give, give us a, a sense of who the real Carl 
was? Because I'm sure they wouldn't have an affinity with him if they, if they found out more about him. Well, I think the funny thing was that Carl was constructing himself from popular culture as well. I went to his house in 2003 and 4, and uh, there was pictures of Scarface and Goodfellas, Reservoir Dogs and so forth. So, in a sense, he was creating himself out of popular culture. So, uh, and it was always that kind of movie uh, narrative arc, you know, the, the flawed hero who's uh, battling against overwhelming odds, the underdog who somehow comes out at, on top at the end, and that, that's how he saw himself. And the, the last reel would be him walking out of jail, having helped society uh, right the, uh, you know, the corruption of Victoria's police force and so forth. So, um, yeah, he, he certainly did uh, see himself in those terms. You, you talk about going to his house. Now, some people would imagine it'd be hard to, to get, a, uh, get information out of uh, major criminals like this, but in a, in a lot of ways they just love being written about, don't they? Yeah, people say, would say to me, when she's scared being with him, I'd say, well, no, I think he would kill the storyteller last. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, really, they really were about uh, constructing a, a self-justification um, and also also a guys involved in the drug world were saying to me, Carl included, that, well, um, you know, we sell drugs to kids that want them, you know. Uh, alcohol's slaughtering our society, but, you know, drugs are killing people. Of course they do to some extent, but they had this idea that they wanted to get this message out as well, that they weren't as bad as, say, the guys selling drugs or selling alcohol legally. It was sort of weird. Uh, Carl Williams was underestimated by the criminal world, wasn't he? They, they think of him as this kind of fat, soft, lazy outsider. What, what, what was it about him that, you know, sl slipped under the radar and allowed him to get to the top? Well, he was all those things, but he also he had a lot of money as well, so he could pay to have things done. So if people displeased him, as the Morans did when they shot him in the stomach in 1999, he could pay to have them murdered. So and he was paying big money. So uh, they certainly did underestimate him and uh, to their cost. Uh, his family background in many ways drove what he did. Tell us more about that. Well, they'd come from a really dirt poor background. Both his mother and his father had been in a camp in Melbourne called Camp Pell, which was where the American troops were uh, um, bunkered down during the war. And once they left, uh, the homeless and destitute families were put there because there was a huge influx of migrants coming into Melbourne. Suddenly the housing shortage was exacerbated and they were there for more than 10 years. Um, they were derided as the, the, the scum of society, the dead end kids and dead-end people and so forth. So um, Carl's parents grew up with that ringing in their ears. Um, by contrast, the Morans had come from an almost middle-class uh, echelon of, of the crime world. They'd been in the, uh, down at the docks, in the abattoirs, in the SP betting game and so forth, and they had, they had a place in society, whereas the Williams had come from the bottom. So when um, uh, the Morans tried to stand over Carl, there was this powerful resentment that was unleashed, and, uh, and it was driven by the whole family, I believe, to say, well, stand up for yourself. We're not going to be you know, stood over again, and their reaction was very much based on that. And, and you went through the old newspapers of the 1950s, like the Argus, and it talked about Camp Pell, and they predicted that the Camp Pell could have implications generations down, didn't it? Oh, sure, like there was this moral contagion in the air that somehow these people who were there through no fault of their own, except the, you know, the, the system drop them out the bottom, were, um, you know, breeding moral, you know, corruption and so forth in there, and this would be played out dead-end people would have dead-end kids and it was somewhat self-fulfilling. These people were sort of shot out into the suburbs after that and uh, they were never really brought into the, uh, the social welfare net and so forth and they, that's where they ended up. Uh, Carl Williams' life of course came to a brutal end, his skull being uh, smashed by a fellow prisoner. What, why did the authorities not see this coming given word was leaking out that he had become a police informant? Well, Carl was the best judge of his own safety. I'd spoken to him several days before this, this occurred and asked the question, are you happy with your placement with uh, Matthew Charles Johnson and Tommy Ivanovic? And uh, the word came back, good as gold. We're fine, you know. So uh, uh, there had been very little inkling that, that, that things could go wrong. But I guess he always knew that, that being an informer was a, a short and dangerous occupation. Uh, but it, it did come as a surprise, I believe. Why was he so confident that he was OK there? Well, because he was, uh, you know, he'd always had tough guys around him. He, he, he flattered himself that he could uh, control them and, and keep them sweet, as he used to say. And uh, unfortunately, when word got around that he was informing, this began to uh, uh, colour people's view of Johnson. So uh, I think that was uh, unfortunately... Um and now, his testimony would have been crucial in the Crown's case against Paul Dale over the, the Hodson murders. Now, police say that Paul Dale had nothing to do with Carl Williams's murder. Are they any closer to resolving who was actually behind it? 
Uh, no, not really, no. Uh, the, the case has been withdrawn at the moment. Uh, police continue to work on, on aspects of that case, but uh, without informers it's going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, to have a strong case there. Do you think his celebrity played a role in, in making him a bigger target? Well, I guess if you get big and, and you murder a lot of people and, you know, you've gathered a lot of enemies, don't you? You know, and I think people felt well, he I was imagine. too big I'm for his sure myself. <laughs> <laughs> what does the car Williams tale tell us about police corruption and, and how you go about limiting corruption in the force? Well, I think the whole problem was that the, uh, the two sides of the war had their own corrupt police in tow. We'd seen the, the drug squad, or at least elements of it in Victoria, had become part of the problem. They'd had the system where they were delivering drugs into the underworld to follow, um, uh, you know, the, the path to the uh, amphetamine cooks and so forth, and uh, it corrupted them. Suddenly they were making a profit from these uh, precursor chemicals, and I'd argue that the, uh, the, the top brass in Victoria Police were never brought to account for the, uh, just the intolerable temptation they placed before those members. Uh, in the drug squad. Tell us more about that because some of the people who were, you know, it was their job to go after them ended up being criminals themselves. Oh sure, there were several uh, officers who, who went to jail in the end, uh, you know, uh, getting involved in trafficking themselves. Um, in fact, their cases couldn't be brought to court um, or, or had to be put through the courts before Carl and Tony Mockbell could be uh, processed for their drug dealing uh, charges that had been there in the past. So uh, that delayed the system, gave Carl and Tony Mockbell and others a, a, a get out of jail free card and so life went on for a while or, or too long for them. Adam, thanks very much for coming in and telling us about your book. A pleasure. Adam Shand there and that is all for The Drum today. Thanks very much to the panel, Kate Fairman, Simon Cowan and also Bernard Keane from Crikey. You can check out The Drum online at abc.net.au forward slash The Drum. Julia Baird will be in the chair tomorrow night and I'll be back on Wednesday night. I'll catch you then. Carl or Penny Mockbell could be uh, processed for their drug dealing uh, charges that had been there in the past. So uh, that delayed the system, gave Carl and Tony Mockbell and others a, a, a get out of jail free card, and so life went on for a while or, or too long for them. Adam, thanks very much for coming in and telling us about your book. A pleasure. Adam Shand there, and that is all for the drum today. Thanks very much to the panel, Kate Fairman, Simon Cowan, and also Bernard Keane from Crikey. You can check out the drum online at abc.net.au forward slash the drum. Julia Baird will be in the chair tomorrow night and I'll be back on Wednesday night. We'll catch you then.